confidence intervals are great for interpreting and communicating estimates. So here we see 50 different estimates for sperm counts of Japanese quail. And some of them are going to have the mean. So there will occasionally be an error if you do enough of these confidence intervals. But you can see that it's relatively small and it corresponds to the percentage of uh, confidence that we have. So if we're doing 95% confidence, then 95% of uh, these confidence intervals should line up with the true mean. So what conclusions could you draw from these confidence intervals? What you might say is that the top ones are not likely different because they overlap here quite substantially. And the other ones are quite likely different. So you have confidence intervals that don't overlap. And so you might say with 95% confidence, these two values are different. So it corresponds to some of our hypothesis testing, but in a much more intuitive way, and it gives a bit of a sense of practical significance, which we'll talk about soon. When making a confidence interval, we have to choose the level of confidence, 95%, 99%, etc. How do we choose or interpret this? Well, this is where we get to significance. So the mean is a simple statistical model that can be fitted to data. Statistics professors have 2.6 friends. We can re represent how well it models the data. For example, uh, 2.6 plus epsilon i friends, which is true in general. I keep repeating this. Make sure you keep it in your head. So you have outcome i is the model plus epsilon of i. Remember that we often want to test hypotheses. And the way to do this is through a test statistic, which will depend on the models we are using. The test statistic is the variance explained by the model over the variance not explained by the model. In other words, it's the ratio of signal to noise. And so if you have a strong signal or you reduce the noise, then you have some sense of a conclusion that you can make. Let's talk about error. A type one error is when we believe there is an effect, but there isn't. And the level of significance, denoted as alpha, is the probability at which we decide to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So the probability of a type one error uh, is level of significance. It's often arbitrarily 5% or 1% or 0 0.05, 0 0.01. Uh, these are very common values, but it basically comes from a historical note that a statistics uh, statistician created a table of values and couldn't fit everything in there, so chose values of 10%, 5%, and 1%. And then everyone just adopted it. So think critically about your level of significance. A type two error is when we fail to defect, detect an effect. And the uh, beta level is the probability of making a type two error. Cohen recommends that this is less than 0.2, so this gives you an idea of the magnitudes that you want to prevent. One thing you've probably also heard of is the power, which is 1 over beta, 1 minus beta, which is the probability of detecting an effect if it exists. And some of the tests we see in this class have a higher power than others, which allows us to detect that effect, detect that signal um, more easily than others. So now it's your turn again. Individually, answer these questions. What is the level of significance of tests made with a 95% confidence interval? How would they change visually if we made them 99% confidence intervals? What would the new alpha be? And if you kept alpha the same but wanted to increase power, what would you do? How would the graphs change? Go. To answer these questions myself, I would say that the level of significance of tests made with 95% confidence intervals is 5% or 0.05 because um, it is the remaining part of the confidence, right? How would they change visually if we made them 99% confidence intervals? It would be larger because we're allowing a larger range of values to possibly be correct. And what would the new alpha be? Uh, it would be 1%. If you kept alpha the same but wanted to increase power, what would you do? Well, since standard error depends on both the um, standard deviation, which we would assume is going to stay relatively constant the more values that we have and the number of samples uh, number of observations in our sample n you could increase the number of samples which would then decrease the standard error this would also decrease the size of the confidence intervals so you'd have a narrower bound with the same level of alpha um, if you increase the sample size now it's important that we talk a little bit about p-hacking. p 
P-hacking is the misuse of data analysis to find patterns in data that are statistically significant when there's no real underlying effect. In essence, you can make anything significant if you really wanted to. Like I said, if you increase the number of observations in your sample, you can decrease those error bars and then remove overlap. So by collecting enough data, you will always find something, some significant difference, even if it's not necessarily practically significant. Your goal as data scientists and data analysts and researchers will be to listen to the data, understand what they're saying and convey that information. So it's really important to have a notion of practical significance. A study finds that statistics professors have a mean of 2.6 friends, significantly more, P is less than 0.05, than mathematics professors who have a mean of 2.55. Haha, <laughs> take that mathematics professors. What does this mean? I would say not much, practically significant, practically speaking. The difference between 2.6 friends and 2.55 friends means they're both basically not having a lot of friends. So how do we communicate practical significance? One important way is to report means, confidence intervals, and explain the practical significance. Give the actual values and interpret it for someone who's reading through your report. And think about whether that difference of 0.05 friends actually makes a difference for a person with friends. We also can show this through effect size. Effect size is a standardized measure of the magnitude of an observed effect. There are several effect sizes that exist. Common ones might be Cohen's D, Pearson's correlation coefficient R, which you may have seen just from correlation, and odds ratios. Small effects tend to be, um, you know, R is 0.1, D is 0.2, which explains 1% of total variance. Medium effects are a little bit larger, and large effects here. So you can look at these values across any domain to have an idea of how much variance is being explained and an overall understanding of what, a, uh, what the size of the effect is. But it's important to note that this is not linear, so you need to make sure you have an understanding of these values and what a big effect might be based off the measure that's used. It is typically best practice to report effect size. Depends on your domain, but in HCI and haptics, we try to report effect sizes and give that practical significance, which is going to be important no matter what. But the sizes also depend on context. So again, you can't forget the domain. You can't forget what the data actually are. You want to give that information 